it's fine. <laughs> Give life, you are love. You bring light to darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Praise. 
Well, welcome to Seminary Church. My name is Chris, and I've been a pastor here for about one year. I'm so glad to have everyone here today. To begin, we're going to have an announcement video, and then we'll have a few words. So just in case we missed some of those announcements, here's a quick wrap up. This week, Crafty Corner meets on Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., followed by Women of Faith. This um, next week on August 14th, we're going to have a special session in between the two services. We're talking about a mission project. On August 26th, we have uh, our booth 
Seminary Church is going to the Roanoke Farmer's Market. We're going to have a booth. And then, of course, we're going to have a special joint service here in the sanctuary on September 4th. Um, instead of having two separate services, we're going to have one separate service. And just one correction about the announcement video. Uh, last week was the last Sunday of some more Sunday. So unfortunately, tonight, there won't be a s'more Sunday, but we're going to try to have some ideas up ahead on the future of what to do on Sunday nights. We wish, just want to welcome you to the service today. Um, our church believes that people matter to Jesus, and therefore they should matter to us. And so you're here today as kind of a proclamation and an answer to prayer because for weeks now, for actually months now, actually since Lent of this year, a group of us have been praying here on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. and just asking God, what do you want Seminary Church to do? And this idea of two separate services was kind of born out of this, and we're not sure if it's here to stay, but we are convinced that God's going to speak to us during this time. So during these next five weeks, these next four weeks, uh, five weeks was last week. I can, I can do math. I can do math. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I, it's been a long morning. Give me some grace. No, joking. Yeah, um, the, the next four weeks, we just ask for your patience. If you see something that you think could be a little bit better, let us know. If we ran out of coffee, just let us know. If, if the music's too loud, just let us know. We're trying to figure out how to make sure that this church can continue to support everyone who's here and reach our community as well. So we thank you for coming out today. We're excited to begin worship today. And with that, I think we have our first hymn. So I'd like to invite the praise team to please come forward as we sing our first praise song, This is Amazing Grace. So please stand to your, in, to your feet and body or in spirit, and let's get this show going. Take it away. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in all Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never oh, stop you working. Are. Maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 One more time. That is who you are. 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 Amen. We can take a few minutes to meet and greet each other. Amen. At this point, I would like to invite Jenny Gross 
to come forward to talk about a upcoming few events that we have here at Seminary Church. And during this time, we would like to make sure that the children, we're going to have Children's Church in the sanctuary today, so make sure you have a activity bag. If you don't have one, we can have Bree, one of our, yes, bring them around, so activity bags. But Jenny, what, what's coming up in the fall here? Are you here to talk about some fall float building and some activities to be at your house, right? Here is the microphone. Pray tell, what is it that our church is doing in August? Are we just going to hang out and eat? Food or do something? Well, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm here for the food, but she has... <laughs> say more. So what, what's going on? What's going so on? So we are, I think, on the fourth or fifth year that we are going to come over to our house and we're going to build a float for the fall festival. All right. So at 5.30, we kind of do a kitchen. So this very first time, uh, we're going to have you bring a pizza to share. And you can enjoy any pizza that's there. And then we will start working and planning on the float. Okay, so I see here, it's in the bulletin, it says August 12th, August 19th, August 20th, and August 20, maybe 7th? It's actually supposed to be the 27th. Okay, okay. That was an oops on my Okay, so Jenna, if, if, I, if I am not good with my hands, let's just say I can, you know, I, can I still show if, up? If you can glue, and you can cut. Well, that's me, I mean, I can eat. And you can use a staple, like a staple gun. A staple gun. Good. So you're saying even I, you're even going to let the pastor show up there? And be there? Yeah, absolutely. The so, more the merrier. Okay, so what what time does it start? We're going to start eating at 5.30. And then after we eat, because our belly is all full, then we'll okay. build. And you said the first Sunday we're supposed to bring a pizza. What about the following Sundays? I haven't decided that yet. Okay, so <laughs> maybe like a potluck or something? It'll be some sort of pet carry-in or something. Okay, we're okay. We're trying to make it easy because yeah, it's yeah. Friday night and after school, I'm exhausted. So yeah. it's going to be an easy Okay, easy pitch. And so, who here was hanging out? Have you ever been to Craft, uh, not Craft, S'more Sunday? We just showed up and had a good time and ate some food and did some things. This is going to be our S'more Sunday in August, but it's kind of on Friday and Saturday. It's like, S'more Friday, S'more Saturday, <laughs> S'more every day of the week, y'all. Like, <laughs> joking, if joking. A gun, if you have a staple gun, please bring it. Staple guns. Always in need of more staple guns. Okay, round of applause for Jenny. We're talking about the float building that's coming to your. Truly, this August at the Gross Family Household. All right. Are there any other prayer requests that we would like to pray for going into this week? We always have a time where we invite our congregation to share praises or prayer concerns. This week, we, of course, want to uplift prayers for Keith Hartley, Lynn Swainer, Diana Hathaway's brother, Keith Treffler, Norma Carroll, and Kevin Luthan. In addition to these, are, is there anything we'd like to uplift in prayer for and praise? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yikes. Sure. Prayers, yeah. So prayers for a family in the community whose mother is going through just kind of a series of tests and diagnostics. That's awfully scary. And prayers for a coworker who is praying maybe towards the end of life. That's scary as it all gets. So thank you, Bree. We will definitely keep them in prayer during this time. Yeah. Is there anything else? Yes. Yeah. Oh. So Drew is traveling to Germany today, and Jana is recovering from back surgery. Okay. Nice. We will definitely hold them in prayer. Thank you. Are there anything else to lift up in prayer or in praise? All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, praise. That's right. Praise. It's awesome to... We're, we're, it's awesome to be 
here worshiping the Lord Jesus and uh, reaching out. So amen on that. Amen on that. Let's see. All right. Well, if you would, let us bow our heads in prayer. We'll go into this time praying. And we'll conclude, of course, by reciting the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for connecting my family with the members of this church. Lord, I pray that I will be able to continue the mission and ministry that they have carried on for so many years, Lord. Oh, one year ago, we came here as complete strangers, and today I sit here looking around and seeing so many friends who welcomed myself and my family and Chelsea here. Lord, for this, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise. I pray, dear God, during the time that I am here that I will be able to stay on my knees in prayer, fasting and reading the scriptures and pointing them to you, God, as a life-giving source. Oh, Lord, would you hear our prayer? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with us as we strengthen our witness with our Christian brothers and sisters in this world, Lord. Why the hen enemy would hate to admit it, God, you are establishing your kingdom in this world as we speak, dispelling darkness and introducing light, saving souls and redeeming them from the eternal abyss. And the reality, Lord, is that in this day, every nation and every tongue and every tribe, there are people who are proclaiming your name. And it's amazing to admit it, Lord, that you are triumphant. And it's at your name that every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. But Lord, the reality is that many of us, including myself, we come here today knowing that we have fallen short of our expectations and we have fallen short of your expectations. Lord, we have done things that have hurt others. We have done things that have hurt ourselves. And for this, Lord, we're just asking you to forgive us, asking you to redeem us, asking you to restore us, because the reality is that nothing else in this world no one else in this world can forgive our sins except for you and you alone. So, Lord, right here, right now, no matter what we've done, no matter how many times we've done it, Lord, we bring this before you today and ask for your forgiveness, God. Please be with everyone in this church this week. For those who are adjusting to loss of a loved one, please be with them. For those who are going through a time similar to it, Lord, we ask you to be with Bree's coworker. Lord, for those who are recovering from surgery, please heal them. We ask you to be with Jana. Dear Lord, for those who have just started this school year, we ask you to bring comfort to the parents and the teachers as students as they go through this new period of transition. And Lord, for those who are going through tests, like a family in the community who's trying to figure out what's going on, or Lord, for those who are traveling across the country right now, Lord, please be with them. God, please be with our church as we try to faithfully reach our community. Please help us extend our arms wide open to those in our town, our neighbors, our strangers, our families and friends. Lord, please be with the orphans and the widow, the fatherless and the weak. And let seminary church really make a difference here in our community. And it's with that, Lord, we come to you together today, reciting the prayer that's said with churches all over the world. The text will be up on the screen. Feel free to please recite with me the Lord's Prayer together as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have a short video to introduce our sermon topic today.
Our scripture text for today is taken from Romans, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I'll be reading from the New International Version. There is a Bible in the pews that's a new revised standard version, but of course the text will be up on the screen. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And it reads like this. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been now justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we, are, we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more have been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is it so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was an ordained Anglican priest. He prayed daily. He fasted weekly. He was even elected a Lincoln College Fellow in Oxford. Despite all of that prestigious background, he still, in his own words, claimed that, did, claimed that he did not have peace with God. Then one day, several years later, when he was at Aldersgate reading Martin Luther's preface to the commentary on Romans, he had a moment, he had an insight, that very time that Christ died for him. I guess you could say in his own words, he said, quote, my heart was strangely warmed. And from that moment after, his life was never the same. He went on to become a missionary to the United States. It's estimated that he rode over 25,000 miles on horseback, preached over 40,000 sermons. In fact, all the churches in the United States are started from his movement. And I guess, why do I tell you all that? I tell you all that to tell you this. Because he was reading Romans, and he finally understood what it is that Paul was saying. I guess I'm here to say, dear church, that this book can really change your life. Just how much? Look at what John West did. He became a missionary. He gave up what he was doing, all because he understood the concept, you've been justified by grace through faith. By now you may know my story, but if I haven't shared it yet, it goes something like this, like, I was baptized as an infant. I grew up in church. I attended church weekly. I was an acolyte. I was an altar boy. Did all the things in church that you ought to do. But still, I didn't have peace. There was one time when it was in college when I was really trying to understand how it is that God forgave me when all of a sudden it hit me that Christ actually died for me. And for the first time in my life, I began to have peace. For the first time in my life, I recognized that no matter what God brought this way, God can handle it. I guess you could say ever since that moment, I recognized a little bit more of what Paul was saying in this text, that you have been saved by grace through faith. 
And I'm telling you here, church, because I guarantee you, if we really understood what it is this text was saying, we'd have more to jump about, more to shout about, more to praise about. Because I guarantee you, all of us here today, we're still beating ourselves up from things we've done in the past, and the reality is that God's forgiven you already. What do I mean by saying this text will change your life? Well, here's one more example. On September 11th, 2001, where people were fleeing from the World Trade Centers after they had been hit by one of the first jetliners, Michael Fallon Judge, an American Franciscan friar and Catholic priest, rushed to the site. Now, I want to be careful about how I say this. Many of us have family members who were directly impacted by this or indirectly impacted impacted by the terrorist attacks on September 11th. So I don't want to make light of this. But check this out. When everyone else was running away from 9-11 Ground Zero, this guy was running to Ground Zero, praying for people, assisting others, comforting the firemen. And when he around, arrived at Ground Zero, he met Rudy Giuliani, the mayor of New York, who asked him to pray for the city and victims. And so there was Michael Judge praying over the bodies going into the lobby of the World Trade Center, praying for the rescuers, the injured, and the dead. And when the South Tower collapsed, debris fell into the lobby of the North Tower, and Michael Fallon Judge died from the impact on the scene. And later on, they found this prayer in his helmet. It said, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Let me Tell me what you want me to say, and Lord, keep me out of your way. And I tell you these stories because, dear church, they all have something in common. And the first story, a normal Anglican priest read Romans and had an amazing conversion, and the rest of his life was forever changed. And the second story, I kindly figured out to myself that God could forgive me, and my life since that moment has never been the same. Michael Fallon Judge got it. And so it gave him the power, the peace, the ability to run into a burning building, so to speak, and live life differently. And I guess I'm here to say that the concept we pick up from Romans 5, that is by God's grace that you are saved through faith, if we dig a little bit more deeper, I guarantee you, church, it can change your life. So turn to the person next to you and say, you need some life, you need some life change. Say, whoo, you need to upgrade. You need to upgrade in your life because we're going somewhere. So let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this in Romans. Okay, last week, here's what we covered. Romans 1 says this. We talked about the problems of sin, the fact that it separates us from God, the fact that all of us have sinned and fallen short. That's Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the sad reality is this, that we all have experienced pain. All have experienced alienation. All have experienced the broken relationships. I don't have to explain sin that much because you probably know what it's like. You know what it's like to have alienated relationships, broken friendships, hurt, distance. That's what Romans 1 up to 5 says, that all have sinned, all have fallen short, and all are capable and expect their due punishment of death. And while the book of Romans has a lot to say after that, themes of rebellion, themes of salvation, themes of saving from sin, themes about church growth, things about our growth, what I would like to do next is uplift two things. The first was, again, what I uplifted last week, that all have sinned and fallen short. But the second thing is that there's only one person who can rescue us from this sin. And that is Jesus Christ. Let's quickly review the text just to make sure we're on the same page. I'll read only one verses one to eight. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As Chelsea so wisely told me yesterday, anytime you see in the text, therefore, you have to ask, what is it there for? And what it's saying is, up until this point in Romans, Paul is talking about how we all have fallen short, how we all have sinned, how we all need a Savior, how we all can't free yourself. And in chapter 5, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, check out what it says, we now have peace with God. 
and through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory. Not only so, but glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, and our hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has important to our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, and very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly die. But God demonstrates his own love in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Christ died for you. That's what Romans 5, 6 says. When we were utterly hopeless, Christ came at the right time and died for us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at myself in the mirror, I don't think about, oh, I'm so righteous. I'm so holy. I'm so majestic. I mean, if I did that, Chelsea would, she be called, she would let you know. Like, Chris just walks around the house. Oh, oh, look at me. I'm walking around like I'm floating. No, Chelsea says, pick that up. What are you doing? You left some dirty dishes. Come on. I don't think of myself as worthy of receiving God's grace. I don't think of myself as an upright person, but here's an amazing fact here, that we are justified, justified, justified by faith alone. It's one of the five essentials of the Protestant Reformation. This doctrine asserts that on the basis of faith, believers were made right for the transgressions of the law. And the reason why this is important is because, let me tell you, you are beating yourselves up for things you did yesterday, for things you did a week ago, for things you did in college, for things you did in your first marriage, your second marriage, no marriage, you beat yourself up every single day expecting that these things shock God or surprise God or anger God. And what this thing says is when we were utterly helpless. Here's what it means. It doesn't matter what you've done, who you've done, how many times you've done it. Christ died for you when you were utterly helpless. And this proves God's love for us. This proves that it's not on the basis of your works or on your deeds or anything you have done that can justify. Justify means almost just as if I've never sinned. And I'm not sure about you, but that's some good news. Because if you were to see all the sins that I have, there wouldn't be enough ink on, there wouldn't be enough paint on this wall to fill it all up. Imagine like I'm going before the courtroom and all these things are printed off, all these things are going on, and someone walks to the judge and just says, oh, we see everything that you've done. But you know what? You're acquitted. Just as if you've never sinned. That's what Romans 5, 6 says. Everyone nods your head. You guys are looking at me like you need some more coffee. Go get some more coffee. Come on back here. We're diving in the Bible today. Because, listen, we beat ourselves up all the time. We hold on to things, and that's what I'm saying. First things first. So I want you to understand this, that this is a basic Christian doctrine. I mean, this isn't just something I made up. This is sola. I mean, this is basic Christian doctrine. Look at what it says in verse 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith. In the first five chapters, he was talking about how we've all been fallen short, how we all left to our own vices, how we have no way of escaping. But he starts off in verse, chapter 5, verse 1, says this, we have all, says this, therefore, since we have it justified through faith, we have peace. And this is a big deal, like I said before, it's one of the five essentials of the Protestant Reformation. And this is good because, again, we beat ourselves up. But I guess the second thing is, wait, there's more than that. It's not just that we're justified. It's not that just we're forgiven, but there's more to it. Look what the text says in verse in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what this peace looks like? It means peace that we've been reconciled to God. Peace because there's no more hostility between us and God. Peace because there's no sin blocking our relationship with God. Peace because we know that Jesus Christ has paid the ultimate sentence. Peace knowing that we have undeserved privilege. Peace knowing that instead of becoming God's enemies, we are now his own children. It's a quietness. It's a rest. It's a tranquility. It's a harmony. It's that Old Testament concept of shalom that allows you to live in this life 
with a comos, eternal cosmic sense of peace. You don't have to worry about what happens when you die. You don't have to worry about what happens. You have peace with God. And because of this peace, all else is changed. It's kind of crazy, but here's what it says in verse 2. We now boast in the hope of the glory. Not only so, but we boast in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces character and perseverance and character and perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because it has been God's love that has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. And this is a powerful sequence Paul lays out because it clearly says in the text that you will experience trials in this life. You will experience sufferings in this life. Consider what James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says. Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. But church, these things are meant to grow us. These things are meant to endure us. These things are meant to make us into the image of Christ's Son. And as I wrap things up in summary conclusion, I just want you to turn back to the stories we read today as actual examples of what happens when you in your heart recognize that it has been by grace you have been saved. John Wesley, an ordinary preacher, an Anglican priest, left his prestigious job post at Oxford College and went to go be a missionary to the United States, traveled thousands of miles on horseback because he recognized that he had been saved by grace through faith. Me, an ordinary person, I was just an ordinary church member. I never wanted to be a pastor growing up. I never thought I was holy growing up. But the minute I recognized in my heart that God said, your sins have been forgiven is when I thought to myself, God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll meet who you want me to meet. And ever since that moment, life has been different. And as I invite our special musician to come forward, oh, actually, we'll, have, we'll take communion first. So, but get ready, get ready, special musician. We're on our way. Here we go. That's the, heads, that's the audible. There we go. Get, get really ready. Stretch, stretch those fingers. Let's go. Come on. But we ought to be living life like Michael Judge Flynn. When catastrophe strikes, instead of running away from it, running to it because we have that peace. We have peace through Christ. So in summary conclusion, I just want to say this, that last week we learned that we have a problem. This problem is sin. This problem has separated us from God. And once we were separated from God, there's nothing we can do. And in fact, to be honest, the awful thing about sin is once it gets in you, the devil tries to come and separate you and alienate you and discourage you and make it worse. So once you have that problem of sin, you're left to your own devices. But that's the good news of today, is that we're not left in our sin. We have someone to rescue. But I guess my question to your church is this. Have you had that change of heart? When John Wesley had that change of heart, it was a whole different ballgame. When I had that change of heart, it was a whole different ballgame. When Michael Flynn Judge had that change of heart, it was a whole different ballgame. But long story short, I simply want to leave you with this question. Have you had that change of heart? Do you know in your heart that Christ died for you? Or are you still trying to have a spreadsheet of everything you've done good and everything that you have fallen short on and going to God saying, God, I'm so sorry. God pushes that aside and says, listen, have I not already forgiven you? Have you had this change of heart? If not, then church, during communion, I encourage you to go to God, asking him to change your perspective. We know that everyone wants to improve our spiritual health. 
But the truth of the matter is we often let our anxieties, our frustrations, and our disappointments and our failures, let them get the best of us. And so as we come into church week after week and month after month and year after year, hoping that it makes a difference for us, but the reality is, as we know too well, sometimes it doesn't make a difference for us. And I'm here today to admit that it's not one other sermon you need. And it's not one other text you need from me. But what you need is actually to be changed by God. And that's exactly why we're here to take communion today. I imagine that for some of us here, we have a lot of things going on. If I were just to get coffee with each of you right now, knowing what we just read, that it means you will be guaranteed to have struggles, and these struggles are meant to transform you. If I were to get coffee with all of you, you might be able to tell me everything that's going on. All the struggles that, are going, that you're going through, all the trials and temptations, and I get it. What I'm trying to do is point you now, you don't need this. You don't need me. What you need is in touch from Jesus Christ. What you need is bread for the journey. So as we come to communion today, I just want to say that this is an open time of invitation for all. Jesus Christ says this, Come to me, all who you who are weary and whose load is heavy, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, gentle and humble-hearted, and you will find rest for your souls. This is the Lord's table, and it's at Jesus' table where he invites us to share in this joyful feast. From east and west and north and south, people will come and take their place at this banquet in the kingdom of God. This table does not belong to any denomination. This table does not belong to any church. It belongs to Jesus. And I was at this table that he met people and heard their stories and shared his. It was at this table that he deepened his friendship with poor folks and prostitutes in the business class and bystanders. It was at this table that he shared profound insights into who God is and what God wants you to do. And I was at this table with the bread and wine that he initiated the sacrament that we now celebrate. So come to this table today. Don't think of this as, this isn't for me. Think of God saying today, I am for you. So with that, we'll proceed to the communion liturgy for today. Feel free to follow along by reading the text in bold that we put up on the screen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, God, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And when we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made a covenant with your people Israel and spoke to the prophets and teachers. And in Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night that Jesus met with death, he took bread. He gave thanks. He blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant, poured out for you and for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
And so, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. So, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts. Then in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor, glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to invite our communion steward to please come forward and our special musician. The table is set. Please come. Out of the wilderness Into your deliverance Look where I'm standing now These hands that once were chained Now lifted high in praise Look where I'm standing now. Look where I'm standing now. I stand on a chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. by your mighty hand into the promised land look where I'm standing now you carry the cross for me now I am a child of the king oh, look where I'm standing now look where I'm standing now Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. I stand on a chain. Miracle making, powerful name of Jesus on the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. 
Jesus, my Savior, rescue me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescue me. Hallelujah, I'm free. I'd like to invite the worship team to please come forward as we have our closing songs. As the worship team's coming up, I, I just want to share a little uh, story from this morning. So um, I just want to encourage everyone, you know, Sunday morning is a great time for us to be together, but nothing beats spending time with God during your week. And um, this morning when I was looking at couple different devotionals that I like to go to um, guess what verses were there in both of them Romans 5 1 yeah. both of them you know uh, I just want to encourage us you know God will speak to you if you just spend time with him he loves you so much um, he's done so much for me and he's rescued me and like Chris was saying at the end of the sermon ask yourself that have you started that relationship with him? And if you haven't, we would love to talk to you about that. So we're going to sing two more songs to finish off our time together. This one is a beautiful one. If you don't know it, um, just listen to these lyrics. But please stand with us and worship. This one is Rescue Story, and then we're going to finish with is Power in the Blood. empty-handed, crying out from the pit of my despair, and there you were, in the shadow.
Calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story, lifting me up from the ashes. You carry my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. You never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You are my testimony. Oh, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You are my testimony. Oh, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You are my testimony. Calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story, lifting me up from the ashes. You carry my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. You were the voice in the desert. Calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story, lifting me up from the ashes. You carry my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to glory. You are my rescue story. You are, you are, you are my rescue story. You are, you are, you are my rescue story. Amen. All right, let's keep it going. One more here. There's power in the blood. This will be our song of dismissal. We'll sing a couple, then dismiss and start the party. Will you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Will you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. In the blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. There is power.
<laughs> Go in peace, justified and forgiven, knowing that Christ has done the work himself. Go in peace, all men. Would you, would you be free from your burden?